All right. Um, for, so welcome everybody here in the audience as well as online. Um, so yeah, I'm really pleased to uh, be here. Thank you, Buzz, for that introduction. And uh, yeah, uh, we're from Picnic. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm a data engineer. Uh, started uh, only six months ago, so uh, very fresh. Uh, but Dinesh, you've been here for longer. Yeah, I'm Dinesh. I worked at Picnic for yeah a bit more than uh, four years, not five yet, but almost. Uh, I've been a data engineer and following the whole uh, process of setting up our data warehouse, uh, including our data vault model. That's what we're here to talk about today. Uh, I will give the word to, to Michael. He's the one starting uh, and presenting the, the whole. Yes. So um, today on the agenda, um, first uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Picnic. You know who we are, what we do. And uh, mostly that uh, we gather a lot of data. Um, uh, then I'm going to talk to you a bit about uh, Data Vault, which is the model that we use to well, capture all of this data. Uh, the philosophy of Data Vault is all the data, all the time. And uh, yeah, again, a lot of data. And that means uh, that we need some kind of uh, system, some kind of mechanism, some kind of library to uh, automate all these things. And that's where uh, yeah, our Data Vault framework, uh, framework Deep Freeze comes in. Uh, Denise will tell you all about that. And DeepFreeze is a library that we open sourced. And I think it will also be interesting to tell you a bit about, well, why would you open source something like this and how to do this? Um, but first, um, before we begin, um, there's a lot of people here uh, in the audience, so a lot of people here in the chat. Uh, so for the people online, uh, looking to you guys, um, please just write down in the chat, uh, what do you hope to see in today's presentation? Now, uh, while the chat is, uh, you know, doing that, boss, are you monitoring? You're monitoring the chat right as well. So, um, and we have it here also. Um, I'm kind of curious uh, about uh, the people I have in front of me. Um, so, first of all, um, I have some of my uh, picnic colleagues uh, with me. Picnic colleagues, can you please raise your hand? Right. So, uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, data engineering team. Um, who here is all from uh, Somnia itself? Nice, nice, nice. And uh, who are from Sonia is like uh, maybe from the data engineering team or from the data scientist team. And we have uh, our analytics translators. Yes. Um, who here isn't from uh, Picnic or Sonia? Raise of hands. Nice. Very nice to uh, have you guys all here. And um, let's see if we have something in the chat. Well, I have to put this here. Uh, oh, very nice, very nice. Um, so we have uh, Iliana asking, uh, yeah, why to use Data Vault? Uh, we have uh, Martijn is interested in the Python implementation. Um, so yeah, I think those are all things uh, definitely will be coming uh, in our uh, presentation. But first, um, just tell you a bit about uh, our business model. So what Picnic is is uh, we're an online supermarket. Um, our business model is that uh, we're all online. Uh, we give free delivery and we do the lowest price. Um, sounds uh, no, almost too good to be true, but the reason we can do that, of course, is because uh, we have a really efficient supply chain without any physical stores, saves on the rent, uh, makes your deliveries very efficient. And of course, there's a, a lot of tech uh, behind this. Um, so just going from left to right really quickly, uh, we have our suppliers, you know, uh, where we get all our products, they go to our fulfillment centers. Uh, from our fulfillment centers, we go into distribution and we put them in our uh, cute little electrical vehicles and they deliver them to all of the homes uh, yeah, that's ordered something. Um, so uh, question to you is, also you in the chat, um, what data do you think we gather? I want you to just uh, yeah, shout it out and then I'll say whether or not we do gather it. Um, so starting from the back there. Uh, Per person data. What kind of person data? I think uh, where they live. Yes. So address is of course kind of necessary if you uh, do a delivery. So yeah, we gather that. Uh, anything? Uh, anyone else? Okay. Next down the line, uh, we're going one row in the front. Uh, what what kind of data do you think we gather? <clears throat> From the vehicles that you deliver with. All right. And uh, what what kind of uh, so like routes, but also sensory data? Yeah, definitely. We uh, gather. Uh, we have some GPS sensors. Uh, no GPS, and we still have the GeForce uh, also telemetry, telemetry the, yeah. things like that. Um, yeah, we gather all of that. Um, what else uh, do you think we gather? Uh, 
yeah, um, maybe prices of the products? Yes. Uh, so, of course, uh, we we uh, set the prices uh, ourselves, of course, but mm -hmm. we also gather prices for, from, for example, from our competitors. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, I see here in the chat, uh, very active. <laughs> um, let's see. Let's see. Uh, stock, supplier data, custom order data, customer behavior data. So like how you actually uh, do things on the app. Um, do have to note there that uh, it's all, of course, GDPR compliant, uh, anonymized, things like that. So only if you really need access to it, then uh, you have that personal information. If not, uh, you're under the law. Uh, what else do you have? Product data, yeah, dimensions, weather data. Um, so, for example, um, in Dark Sky, uh, we gather a lot. It's I know it's going uh, going to be deprecated, but uh, uh, looking for an alternative for that. So, if you have a good alternative for weather data, then uh, please talk to me because I have to implement it probably. Um, so, yeah, we 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 gather lots of data. Um, that's uh, the short uh, short uh, of it. And uh, yeah, we gather uh, data from all of our operational systems. Uh, so, for example, yeah, the store, the app itself. Uh, we keep track of stock uh, in the warehouse itself. There's lots of activity going on. We track all of those activities, uh, like the picking, for example. Of course, when we distribute something, uh, we have to route it, and then we do like a. Um, of course, we we plan a route, and then we see is it actually followed, and are they actually on time? Uh, we do a uh, lot of tracking of individual articles. Uh, we do tracking of deliveries, and maybe one thing that's not in here is maybe uh, customer feedback. Right. If a customer is uh, maybe not satisfied or is satisfied with something, uh, then that's something that uh, we all have in our data. Um, so that's, uh, that's a lot of data. So I, I did some uh, queries on our uh, data warehouse. Uh, so for we have about five and then 10 zeros uh, in rows. So is, is that billion? Is that a trillion? How much is that? We're in the billions. Um, we have uh, about, uh, yeah, we're in the terabytes, of course. Uh, it's not, uh, it's not small data, it's big data. Um, in terms of, uh, tables, uh, I counted around 15,000. Um, and to be honest, this is only, um, this is only like our Dutch, uh, data. It's only our Dutch data. It's only production data as well. So we have like, I don't know, like copies and dev and we're active in France and we're active in Germany as well. Um, so it's a lot of data. It's a lot of data, and uh, we gather this all in our data warehouse, uh, where uh, we have uh, people actually querying it, like uh, our team of data scientists. Um, we have uh, it says 150 analysts, but I think we're, we're nearing 200, um, so it's quite a lot. Uh, and of course, uh, people in operations, people on the ground floor, are also looking at a lot of our stats as well. Uh, so uh, yeah, that, that's a lot, and um, it's impossible for a team of 10 data engineers to actually make uh, custom queries for almost 200 analysts. So we don't do that. Um, instead, we have a really strong focus on the self-service analytics, um, a lot of SQL and a lot of Tableau. So this is um, just a, a really basic overview of our tech stack. So we extract a lot of data using Python processes, using uh, Stitch, using Snowplow, uh, RabbitMQ. Uh, I think one thing that's missing in here is uh, Kafka, which we're running uh, a lot of uh, experiments with right now. Um, so all of the data comes in, uh, and it comes to our data warehouse, which is on Snowflake, uh, which is uh, yeah basically a, a big database uh, specifically for data warehousing. You can query it using SQL. Uh, and that's where our uh, actually a lot of our analysts uh, use SQL themselves to query our uh, data warehouse. Uh, which is quite unique because uh, our analysts are uh, are pretty good at SQL, and that's uh, I think I haven't seen that anywhere yet. Um, and uh, we use that SQL, of course, to put something in some kind of Tableau dashboard, maybe some kind of Slack report, um, maybe something else. Um, and all of this underneath is orchestrated uh, using Kubernetes. We use a lot of Travis. Maybe uh, we're going to migrate to Team City. Uh, lots of Python, Argo for our workflows. Of course, everything is uh, on GitHub. Um, so yeah, uh, again, strong focus on self-service analytics to actually service our almost 200 analysts. Um, so they can do it ourselves, so we don't have to. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, Deep Freeze and Data Fault, and that lives inside of uh, 
this part of the um, yeah of our uh, flow. Um, so we're going to zoom in. Uh, so what actually live? Uh, what does our data warehouse actually look like? Um, so um, our data warehouse asterisk extremely simplified uh, looks like this. Um, so we have our operational systems again. You know the app store, our warehouse management system, uh, our routing system um, produces a lot of data. Uh, it goes into our data warehouse and we model that data using data vault. Uh, and this is what we call data vault in the back end. Then we transform that uh, data vault model into a Kimball dimensional model. And this is what the analysts actually query. Um, I see my network, uh, my network for bidding is for broken. You can still see me? Okay, then uh, I'm just going to continue. Okay, then I'm just going to continue. Um, so uh, we have data vault in the back end and Kimball dimensional model in the front end. Um, and if you don't know, data vault and Kimball are like two different ways. Yes, okay. Uh, sorry for that interruption. Uh, the internet decided not to work, but uh, then we turn it off and on again. So uh, I think uh, we're all good now. Um, let's see. Yeah, looks good. Oh, um, okay. So um, just to recap, uh, we have data vault in the back end. So we use it as like a capturing layer to capture all of the data all of the time from all of our operational systems. Uh, then we transform that from a data vault model to a Kimball dimensional model. And that's what the analysts actually query. And so the question uh, that I posed is like, okay, why would you do this? Why would you have two different kinds of data models? Um, of course, everything has a trade off, and so does data vault. Um, so uh, data vault has uh, lots of pros. Uh, so the major pros are that it's very flexible and easy to adapt to changing business requirements. And uh, as you all know, business changes all the time. Uh, it uh, changes from week to week. And uh, one week they, they, this, they think of something new and uh, they want to implement something new and uh, we need to load in some new data. Uh, they decide that they want to have more granular data or they decide that we're going to expose some new data. Uh, data vault is very good at adapting to these changing business requirements uh, and it's very nice um, one of the pros is that it favors load performance uh, so what's very nice is again i told you we have a lot of data we capture a lot of data and we don't want to have uh, a build that you know capturing data runs i don't know more than a few hours uh, preferably um, and again, one of the pros is that uh, the mantra of Data Vault is really all the data, all the time. That means that uh, even if we want to go back and say, hey, there's like this nugget of data that we maybe didn't expose in our dimensional model, but we still want to do it now, um, hey, we have it uh, in a, like in somewhere in our history. And that, that's, very, uh, that's very nice, keeps us very flexible. Downsides is, is that it's very hard uh, to query. <laughs> Um, there's uh, many, many joints and many, many things that you need to know about the model itself in order to use it. Um, there's also some effort in that modeling and um, also not very handy is that the read performance is not so high. Uh, so if you have 200 analysts all uh, typing in uh, queries for data vault, um, you're not going to have a good time. Um, but a lot of these cons are mitigated with if you actually use a dimensional model on top of data vault, which is then easier to query, has some better read performance. Um, of course, uh, it costs some effort from the data engineers and it costs some maybe some storage, some computing power. Um, but we still like it. Uh, we keep doing it and uh, it's, uh, yeah, it, it works for us. Um, so again, um, maybe not everybody here uh, knows what data vault is. So I'm going to give you just one small example. You don't need to memorize everything of this, but I'm just going to um, bring you through um, just an example, um, because uh, what's very nice is that we have, um, what's nice about data vault is that it can unify the same concept from dis different systems. Um, so if you think of an order that someone makes on the app, uh, an order means something different for the people that run the app store, and it means something different for the people that run the warehouse management system, and it means something different for the people that run the delivery system. For example, if you're uh, you know, part of the app team, for example, an order means like, oh, a customer ordered something and payment is very important, things like that. If you're in the warehouse um, system, then it's important like, oh, do I have this in stock? Do I need to order this? 
And if you're part of the delivery system, you're more concerned with, okay, uh, what's the address? What kind of route can I make? Uh, what's optimal here? Um, and what's very nice about Data Vault is that we can uh, basically yeah, capture it from these different systems uh, and um, yeah, like organize it in such a way that we unify these concepts. Um, so for example, we get orders from, yeah, again, these different systems, and then we organize it uh, yeah, like in hubs, satellites, uh, in links. Um, if you know Data Vault, this is all very familiar to you. If you don't know Data Vault, don't worry about it. Um, there might be other information that's coming in there, like information about the customers. And uh, again, we're all organizing this in our data vault. And then uh, from our data vault, again, um, we transform it again to our Kimball dimensional model, which uh, is concerned with like facts and dimensions and uh, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, so I talked for a very long time. Um, so in summary, uh, we at Picnic, uh, we gather a lot of data, whether it's from our app store, uh, our vehicles, our uh, warehouse management system. Uh, we capture it all in our data warehouse uh, because we want to focus more on self-service analytics to our almost 200 uh, analysts, to our uh, data scientists, to our ops viewers. And we do that by having uh, a data fault model in the back end and a dimensional model in the front end. So I think uh, that's a pretty short summary of uh, what we do, what we have going on at uh, Picnic in our data engineering team. Um, so uh, if you're with us online, uh, I want to ask you to write it in the chat again. Uh, what is your experience with Data Vault? Do you have any? Do you have none? Uh, is this the first time you've heard of it? Uh, thumbs up, thumbs down, and uh, why? And I'd actually like to ask uh, the same question to the audience here. Uh, so who has never heard of Data Vault? All right, all right, all right. I see many, many hands coming up. Uh, I see bus like kind of, uh, uh, kind of heard of it. Okay, um, it's pretty cool. Then, uh, yeah, then uh, it's. Uh, I hope you learned something new. Um, and of course, we have our team of uh, picnic uh, engineers who uh, work with this uh, almost daily. Um, and maybe uh, one of them can say like, um, "Oh, do you like it? Do you not like it? What's the pros? What's the cons? Like, is it better than before?" Actually, Denise, you uh, you implemented when I, when I arrived, there was already a data vault. Yeah. I already had the data vault model. Yeah, this setup was like the technology stack was like completely different. Uh, but modeling wise, we followed this pattern like right from the beginning, especially. Yeah, so almost five years ago already. Yeah, almost. Yeah, almost. And Picnic is only six years old, so uh, we did this from the beginning. Uh, yes. Uh, we have many questions. Oh, yeah, we have a lot of responses in the chat. So we have uh, yeah a lot of. Um, First time I heard of it, tried it academically, never heard of it, heard of it, did not implement it yet, uh, not professionally, uh, learned about it in our blog posts. So uh, read our blog posts, guys. Uh, uh, so question from uh, Garima, is it like BigQuery or is it something completely else? Um, so BigQuery is also a data warehouse, um, well, system from Google, of course. Um, and I would say BigQuery is comparable to Snowflake, they're competitors. Uh, and you can, of course, implement data vaults on Snowflake, on BigQuery, uh, on Postgres if you really want to. Do you want to? What? Do you want to uh, implement data vault on Postgres or uh, is uh, Snowflake? Okay. I would say that because it's about the modeling technique, not about the database technology that you use. So in theory, in theory, no, in practice, you can you can really implement it in any database uh, because it's prepared for it. So you could you can implement it in BigQuery or Snowflake or Postgres or Oracle or whatever you prefer, whatever is your preference. Uh, because yeah, it's not dependent on the technology that you use. It's more about the framework and the way it's designed and the way it's flexible to extend for business requirements uh, changing. Uh, and that's that's not about the database, it's about the modeling technique. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, and uh, we have uh, Jim here in the chat saying uh, it is the best me methodology for data warehousing because of its ability to grow without breaking and having to redesign. Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely true. And that's the major uh, the major pro uh, of Data Vault is really adapting to changing business needs uh, without having to like refactor everything. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, all right. Um, so I explained in short, uh, yeah, what uh, uh, what kind of data we gather at Picnic, and also that we use Datafall to do it. Um, but now uh, Denise will explain to you a bit uh, more on the technical details on yeah how we do this, and also where DeepFreeze then comes in. Okay. 
Welcome, everyone. Thanks for, for joining. Uh, so first, before we enter into the deep freeze or the SQL generation part of it, uh, let's uh, uh, look at what a, what a data vault flow or data vault pipeline looks like uh, at Picnic. Uh, I can start by saying that all of this is automated in our pipeline. Today, we are focusing on uh, one specific part. But uh, so our flow essentially starts by parsing some configuration. You always have to configure something in your model. Uh, then we have to, under to understand uh, from which point in time we want to fetch our data so essentially we we uh, data vault in general but like most of our processes are based on incremental loads so we have to have a change data capture strategy to understand from which point in time we want to fetch the data uh, then we extract it so this delta of data that changed uh, since our last load uh, then we generate the sql to load it uh, we execute it and we have to say, uh, we have to store this change at the capture record saying, okay, I process this timestamp, I process this execution, so next time you have to go one hour, two hour, three hours further. Um, and we use a mix of Python and, and the SQL to automate this. Uh, and all the orchestration, as, as Michael already mentioned, is done uh, using Python and, uh, uh, and the Argo workflows. Uh, that's what we use. Uh, but today it's good to understand how the whole flow uh, uh, works works but uh, so but today we are here to uh, tell you about the specific part that is the, the generation of SQL to load these data vault models uh, so for to to uh, as you can imagine uh, these type of flows are influenced by a lot of external factors uh, so picnic specific flows picnic specific uh, uh, systems in general and configuration and a lot of uh, external factors uh, but deep freeze focuses on the, on one specific part that is to uh, to generate sql so in the core of our of our uh, data vault framework we have uh, or data vault automation uh, stack let's say uh, we have the generation of SQL queries. Uh, and essentially, conf some configuration enters the minimal possible or only the, the one that is strictly needed, uh, and some SQL is generated. Uh, in order to do this, we have to first deserialize the tables, so understand uh, how the tables look like in the database and uh, deserialize them into Python objects or deep freeze compliant objects. Uh, and then we generate the SQL, so it produces an output of, of uh, SQL to be uh, uh, executed. And there's where deep freeze uh, comes in. So now we are actually introducing it. Uh, we open source it some month ago. Uh, and to give you a bit more history, so we developed it in 2019. Uh, back then was still called Picnic Data Vault and was not an open uh, or uh, yeah, open to the public yet. Uh, and uh, its purpose is uh, so. Why did we name Deep Freeze first? Uh, so first, Deep Freeze for the non-Dutch it means uh, uh, frozen, uh, and it uh, bodes really well, or it's pretty comparable to to or inspired by our cold supply chain. So. We deliver groceries. Part of the groceries end up in the in the customer's uh, freezer and are yeah frozen. Uh, on top of this, the whole perspective of data vault uh, in terms of data loading is that when you load data there, the data never changes. So it's there frozen forever, and you can access it back in time and do some point in time analysis at any point in time. So when it enters in data vault, it never leaves. There's no deletes. There's no updates except for one specific field, but we'll get there. Uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, there's only insertion of data. The data never leaves all the data all the time. Um, and on top of that, uh, the abbreviation or the acronym of deep freeze would be DV, which is also data vault. So it was kind of a no-brainer to, to choose this name. Uh, then here, like really high level, uh, what happens in Deep Freeze? Uh, so it assumes that you extract your data, you place it in some structure that you can call an extraction table or a staging table, uh, and Deep Freeze just produces the SQL that is needed to load all these structures that are linked satellites and hubs. Uh, one thing that was not mentioned yet or briefly uh, is that uh, everything in Data Vault is uh, Easterized. So you can access at any point in time the data, uh, the image of the data that you had back then, independently or the point in time. As long as you were already capturing it back then, you can know how the data looked like back then. Um, then now to really understand what happens here, um, we are going to our favorite analogy, that is the DV, the, the kitchen robot. Uh, and also good to mention that the, the idea of having deep freeze and to have this framework to generate SQL uh, is that the, the idea is for the developer to spend time when it actually matters. So you have to know your source, your source data, you have to know how to model your target model, but you don't have to know uh, or do the boring stuff of like mapping field by field or doing like these this type of uh, things that are difficult to maintain and error prone. Uh, so how does it look like? 
uh, this generation. So first we need our source data, so our ingredients in this kitchen robot uh, analogy. Uh, as you can see here is a simple model. We'll see an, uh, a demo of this model uh, further. Uh, but uh, yeah, just some orders or some details about the order, some creation timestamp, some order status, and the customer that placed the order and the order itself. So this is our source data, let's say, and our source structure. Uh, then we have the... Mm -mm -mm. Okay, uh, then we have the, the configuration. So we have to know when did the extraction start, what is, what is our source data stored, uh, what is our, the name of our source, and other information that is the, only what is strictly needed, uh, essentially. So we have to configure, we have to have the recipe to produce the data. Uh, and then what Deep Freeze does is essentially to cook it and generate SQL. Uh, the SQL execution is in this diagram, but is not executed by uh, by DeepFreeze. But this is the whole idea um, of it. Uh, but going a bit more uh, uh, into a bit more detail and zooming in a little bit on the the theory of this SQL generation, uh, what does DeepFreeze actually do? Uh, so essentially, we do uh, we. First, we start by looking at the metadata of the database, looking at our target model, looking at our target tables, and understanding, okay, this is our structure, this is uh, what these fields mean, this is the name of this field that we're receiving from the source, and getting all the metadata possible, we deserialize it into the Deep Freeze uh, compliant Python objects, so hubs, links, and satellites, but Python objects, not tables in the database. Uh, then we perform a model validity check, so we check if all fields that are supposed to be there are actually there, if you forgot any field, if you have all the dependencies needed in your configuration and if uh, uh, everything is compliant. Uh, then we generate a staging table, a SQL. What is this staging table? So essentially, uh, we have the data that we receive from the source, uh, and then Data Vault has, the, as a framework, it has a lot of specific, mostly auditability fields uh, that are called hash keys, hash divs, uh, timestamps, and uh, uh, more more types of of uh, specific DB specific specific fields uh, that we need to calculate. So this staging table is this object where we we grab the extraction data, so the data that the system uh, knows about and that returned to us. Uh, and we generate this structure that is used as source to populate the whole model. And this table has all the data that exists in the source, plus some extra fields that need to be calculated to be data vault compliant or to load the data vault model in general. Uh, and then after this, we finally generate the, um, the queries to load our structures. Uh, for hubs and links, uh, we use an append only comment. So Whenever the data enters there, it, it's never changed and it, it's uh, it's frozen there forever. Uh, and for satellites, we use the upsert common just for one specific reason. So every record has a start and end timestamp. So if we receive a new record, we have to say that the previous one ended. And that's the only thing that is updated. Otherwise, there is no updates in Data Vault at all. Uh, but it's, it's always good to look at theory. That was good to explain what is our use case. Uh, so let's imagine that like, one of our uh, business teams said, okay, we want to, we have this new endpoint that uh, uh, returns us order, uh, uh, order information, uh, and we want to start capturing it. So the first thing that the developer has to do is to know its source. Uh, in this case, we are not looking at any endpoint, but we are kind of faking our data. Uh, so let's say that this endpoint returns just an order, uh, the customer that placed the order, and some details about the order, in this case, the, the creation timestamp and the status of the order. Then now that we know our that we know our model, uh, the next step is to the design uh, how it looks like in a data vault model. Um, so essentially, we are going to have uh, uh, two hubs. So hubs is where the the IDs of entities are stored. So a, a hub a customer has one row per customer uh, of order as one row per order. Uh, then we will have an order satellite. That's where the status and the creation timestamp will be stored historically. Uh, so if we receive a new order where the status of the same order changed, we are going to insert a new row and say that from this time on, this is the, the actual version. Um, and then we have a link that uh, links the customer to the, the order to the customer that placed it actually. Uh, so as you can see here, like the four fields that we receive from the source are transformed into a lot of fields in the data vault model. A lot of these fields are auditability fields, uh, but um, that's essentially it. So we, we have two hubs, uh, one satellite and one link. Um, then the tables are freshly, uh, freshly created. Uh, so we will, uh, we will have to uh, have a look at them uh, in a bit. Uh, so it's difficult to synchronize my speaking with the, with the, the demo. Uh, but um, so we will create our data vault model first. 
uh, because it's already it was already reviewed by all our colleagues and it's already approved and uh, it's uh, it's already good to go. Uh, now we will check our tables. All of them all of them are, are empty because they were just freshly created. Uh, let's imagine this is the first time that we captured an order or a customer in our system uh, that are there for a lot of years. But uh, yeah. yeah, let's imagine that is the first time. Uh, now what we have to do afterwards is to run our extraction process. In this case, our extraction process is essentially creating a table and inserting dummy data there uh, in an actual process. This would be a flow that fetch data usually from an endpoint and loads it, to, loads it into this extraction table. Uh, so now we are good to go. We have data in our extraction table and we want to tell Deep Freeze, okay, can you give me the SQL to load this, to load this, this model? Uh, and Deep Freeze will do so. Uh, let's have a look at how um, in the Python code. Uh, so first, this, uh, for the purpose of this uh, demo, uh, we are going to create a new SQL file that is that has the queries to load our data vault model uh, to an output path. So that's this first uh, constant of the code. Uh, then what do we have to provide? So the first thing that we have to provide is to tell DeepFreeze how to connect to the database. So essentially, what is the user, what is the database, and every property to perform a configuration uh, or to, to connect to Snowflake. Uh, then we need to provide the Snowflake deserializer. So this is the object that interprets the metadata of the tables from the database uh, metadata and creates DeepFreeze compliant uh, Python objects. Uh, in this case, we will have two hubs one satellite and one link, as I already said before. Uh, and the only thing that we need to provide is what is the schema, where we should fetch the metadata from, and uh, what is the database configuration to access it. Uh, then the most important object is the data vault load. So this is the actual object where the orchestration and generation of SQL uh, actually happens. Um, and what do we need to provide? So first we need to provide what is the extraction table and the extraction schema. So the one that we just populated because we just ran our extraction process. Uh, then we need to provide what is the staging schema and the st staging, scable, uh, staging table name. Uh, that's, uh, again, staging table is the table that will be used as source to, to populate every table in the target model. Uh, then we need to say when did the extraction start? Uh, in this example, we are saying that it's now, which is not actually correct, but because we already ran the extraction a minute ago or so, um, but good enough for, uh, for a demo. Uh, and then the, the target table, so that already deserialized compliant deep freeze Python objects, um, and the, the source, what is the name of our source? In this case, we are saying that this is data from the deep freeze tutorial, which is true. Um, then after this, for the purpose, just you could just print the comments or do uh, whatever you want with them. In this case, I think it makes sense to uh, uh, include them in the file. So I just open the file and write the, the SQL queries uh, uh, there. Uh, and that's essentially it. Uh, then in our main part, uh, in our main uh, piece of code, we just call this single function. And as you can see, this is 50 lines of code, uh, no extra boilerplate code. So as long as you created your model and is compliant, it will generate the SQL for you. Um, then, uh, yeah, so the code already ran. We already have a, a SQL script to, uh, to load our model. And uh, as I said before, first thing that is done is to is creating the staging table. As you can see there, uh, this table doesn't have only the fields that were in the extraction table, but it has these extra fields called hash keys, hash divs uh, that are applicable for essentially every data vault table. Um, and uh, um, this is what is in the staging table. This staging table will then be used as source to all the tables in the target model. Uh, then afterwards, we start loading the hubs. So first we fill in the backbone of our model that are the hubs, the entities, and the links, the relationship between entities. Um, so we, we first started by the customer, could be the order, doesn't matter. We just went alphabetically in general, or the framework just goes uh, alphabetically. As you can see there, we run an append-only comment. So the data enters there uh, with that timestamp and it never leaves and it always stays the same. Uh, same goes for links. So we use actually, we actually use merge comments, but uh, uh, it, they, these only insert data uh, essentially. And then afterwards, we go for the satellites. Uh, the queries for satellites are slightly more complex, uh, also because we have to 
uh, consider that, okay, we have a new version, we have to add a new row to the table, but then we cannot leave do two versions open at the same time. So we have to say that the, the end timestamp of the previous version, now it's updated and the new version was inserted. And that's what you can see in this part of the query. So if uh, the version already exists, that timestamp for that order already exists, we update the timestamp end of that version. Otherwise, we insert a new row uh, into, the, into the target table. And this is essentially what happens. As you could see, uh, there was no time spent on mapping field by field or creating this boilerplate code that uh, uh, that can be a real pain to, to maintain and all the copy pasting of SQL that would be uh, really hassle uh, and that can generate bugs a lot of that a lot of a lot of times are difficult to to debug and to really understand what is happening. Um, and uh, in this case, it was pretty simple. Uh, now we are going to run uh, the, the code just to check that it runs <laughs> and uh, uh, populating our tables. Uh, it will actually be a slightly, slightly slow because, uh, because when, I, uh, when I recorded it, my internet was not the best. Uh, so it will be too slow for four rows, but uh, <laughs> this is not the, the, the normal, uh, the, the normal uh, yeah, time for it to load, of course. Um, so we have to wait a little bit. Uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, so it will load the target tables. Afterwards, we can check our output and that the tables actually have data. Um, let's wait a little bit for it. So everything is loaded now. Uh, let's do a final check on the data in a bit. <laughs> in a bit, in a bit. OK. Uh, so now we should have two rows in the, in the customer table because the four orders were placed by only two customers. Uh, then four rows in the order hub uh, and uh, four rows also in the, the satellite of the table because we only did one load. There is not multiple versions of the same order in this table. Uh, and finally, four relationships between an order and the customer, which we'll get there. Ah, in the satellite, this is also important. As you can see, we have the details of the order there. In this case, the creation timestamp and the, the status. Uh, and here we have the four relationships between a customer and an order, essentially. Uh, and this is pretty much our demo on how it works. Uh, this does not show our whole pipeline because in this case we want to uh, highlight specifically uh, deep freeze. Uh, so we went for the uh, we went for this uh, uh, simulation of dummy data in our extraction table, uh, but I think it can give a good idea on uh, how it works. Um, now let's proceed to uh, a little bit of uh, theory or uh, at least the philosophy of uh, uh, of deep freeze now that we saw the theory of the sql generation and the practice and see it actually running uh, let's uh, talk about about the, the philo a little bit about the philosophy of, of deep freeze uh, so the first point is this restricted uh, scope so the idea is for this framework to generate SQL, that's it. It just has to generate good SQL and, and do it properly and to be, and to be uh, efficient doing so. Uh, and uh, the second one is, as you, as you saw, and I, uh, as I also presented during, uh, during the whole presentation, uh, convention over configuration. So uh, the, the, the SQL is generated based on the model that you already have in your database. Uh, you don't have to do, uh, uh, you don't have to do any like, you have to do the minimal uh, boilerplate uh, uh, code possible. Uh, and so it's, you only provide the configuration that is strictly needed, uh, essentially. Uh, and then we also have the automatic field mapping that, it, that comes from the convention over configuration, essentially. Uh, so we don't have to be mapping field by field and to transform these four fields into these four tables with, I don't know, 20 fields or so, uh, which can be a real pain to, to maintain. Uh, and then it's self-contained. So it's a Python package that has one dependence only, that is the Snowflake connector. So it just needs to know how to access the database and that's it. After accessing the, the database, as long as our naming conventions and our conven all, all our conventions are being followed, uh, the framework can do its job. Its job. Uh, now I will, I will uh, uh, give the word to uh, Michael again uh, and he will proceed with the next steps. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Denise. Um, so yeah, really, uh, really, uh, uh, to be honest, uh, the SQL that uh, Deep Freeze uh, just showed, uh, I actually didn't see it until I worked like, I don't know, four months or five months into Picnic, even though I was like designing data vault models because uh, yeah, it's just very complicated. Lots of uh, things were coming around and uh, I didn't need to think about it. So uh, thank you uh, for that. Um, so um, yeah, what's next for uh, Deep Freeze? 
Um, so Deepfish is out there. You can go on GitHub. You can download it. You can play around it uh, with it. Um, uh, but uh, our main goal for uh, yeah, what's next for Deepfish is to really make it more usable by others. Uh, and one of the main things is, for example, adding support for other databases. Um, so like Denise just said, the only dependency is that it needs to know about your database. Makes sense. Uh, and in our case, we use uh, Snowflake, uh, but we can imagine that, hey, maybe you have something else um, using in your company. Um, so you can add, uh, we want to add more support for, let's say, a Postgres database, a SQLite database, things like that. Um, of course, with more databases comes more uh, things like integration tests. Uh, so we uh, would probably have to do that as well. Uh, and um, the SQL that we generate uh, is good, it's correct, um, but the way we do it uh, might be, uh, there might be a better way, uh, at least better than string formatting. So if you know a better way, please talk to me, put it in the chat, uh, would love to hear on it. And of course, no promises on the ETA because uh, yeah, we're all PC people and uh, we love this. Uh, we uh, we uh, really like uh, yeah, putting it out there. Um, so I have a, kind of a question for you. Um, like, have you ever contributed to open source? And I'm really curious, uh, please uh, put it in the chat as well. Um, so uh, anyone, anyone, like uh, anyone ever contributed to open source? Uh, Denise, of course. Uh, Mathieu, what's, uh, you have the box? The, the Debian operating system. Oh, the Debian operating system. That's, that's very impressive. What, what, was it like a small pull request, big pull request? What did you do? small project within Debian, of course. Okay, okay. Very cool, very cool. I'm sorry, of course. Yes, yes. Uh, so in the back, uh, so one more hand. Um, Apache Airflow. Apache Airflow, nice. What did you, what did, how did uh, you contribute? An SFTP uh, sensor, an operator to fetch uh, more uh, data. Hmm. Uh, not just the single one, but more. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, Is that like in a batch way or like? Like a bigger yeah, it's for capturing with the regular expression and uh, it matches uh, right, the, right, the right. data that you want in an SFTP server. Very cool, very cool. Yeah. Uh, can I ask uh, what motivated you to do that? I needed it. You needed it, yeah. yeah. And then you were like, uh, "I'm going to share it uh, with yeah. the rest, uh, have it reviewed by other people as well." Yeah, yeah this is very nice. It's very nice. Uh, so we have some uh, comments in the chat. Uh, uh, we have uh, May Stoker to the SQL Fluff uh, repository. Very interesting. We use that as well. Uh, I think we started using it two two months ago, something three months. Yeah, and and we also could uh, uh, we contributed. Mathieu made a PR. I made a PR. Uh, very cool. Um, so Jim Freer has uh, answers. Uh, uh, yes, uh, if you use open source, you should contribute time and or money. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I, I really think that's uh, that, that's pretty true because um, you know we all use open source uh, all the time, uh, whether it's your operating system or your Python libraries or what have you, um, and it's really cool to uh, contribute. So um, yeah, that's actually um, what the next slide is about, uh, which is like why would we open source uh, this part of our yeah process? Um, so uh, not gonna uh, mince any words. Uh, it's also a very nice marketing tool. Uh, it gets you uh, many likes on uh, LinkedIn, and uh, it's very easy to give talks about it, such as here. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that it, it is actually very nice to be able to talk so openly about uh, such a pretty essential part of our process, um, because uh, we do think it's cool and we do think that it's nice to put it out in the public. But if you're going to put it out in the public, you better make sure it's good, because uh, it's going to have a lot of eyes on it. Uh, so I think this also like kind of gives you this motivation to actually build better software, uh, make it uh, reliant, well documented, everything. Uh, and then, as uh, we also just mentioned, um, yeah, just giving back to the community because, um, yeah, it, it does feel good to give back to the community. It does feel good to uh, be able to uh, put something out there, and uh, yeah, maybe people can use it. Um, so those are the reasons why, uh, yeah, you can definitely open source uh, things and. Uh, what does it take to actually do this? Um, so uh, it does take uh, quite some work uh, to open source parts of your process. 
Um, and one of the major things is, of course, that you have to decouple it from your existing systems. It's probably very tied in into your systems. Uh, and you have to make sure that whatever you put out there is not picnic specific, but is applicable to the rest of the world. Um, but this is work, but it's not bad work because uh, decoupling things uh, is good. And in our case, for example, well, right now we use Snowflake. We're very happy with Snowflake. Let's say one day we're not happy with Snowflake. Well, our system is decoupled from Snowflake. We can just write a BigQuery or a Postgres uh, deserializer and we're back on track. Um, another thing you have to do when you go open source is you have to write more documentation. So uh, you can go to uh, deepfreeze.picnic.tech and uh, follow this nice tutorial. Um, but that is some work. But again, writing documentation is not bad work, right? It's, it's good for uh, people, for your colleagues. It's good for yourself, like six months down the road when you forgot what you've written. Um, so writing more documentation, yeah, it's, it takes more work to go open source, but it's also good for you. Uh, same again, uh, you have to yeah, test more thoroughly. Otherwise, uh, you get uh, very angry eyes on your uh, repository, or maybe nobody trusts your codes because it's not tested. So you have to write more tests, integration tests, uh, especially if they're not, uh, especially tests that are not picnic specific. Um, but again, writing more tests is is never a bad thing, right? Uh, writing more tests uh, you know, makes your own process better. Um, and the final thing that we have to do is, of course, yeah, we have actually other open source projects. Uh, again, go to picnic.tech to uh, check them out. Um, and there you can find out uh, all about uh, all of our other uh, projects. And um, speaking of uh, other things, um, so if you thought this was uh, very interesting, um, we mentioned this before, but we have a very nice blog wherein we put a lot of uh, stuff. Um, and uh, more like we, we post like a blog post like every month or so. Uh, about uh, something interesting like this. And here are three that I can recommend. Um, one is uh, on the data vault by Bas Fleming, who's actually one of our data scientists, about how he uses uh, data vaults uh, and why it's so nice that we store all the things all the time. Um, of course, uh, our, uh, our tech lead, Iliana, talked a bit about uh, you know, what the data engineer can do in the future of groceries. Um, yeah. Uh, as you can see, like we started with data vault like, at the very beginning, uh, data is very important to us. And the data engineer, therefore, is also very important to us. Uh, and finally, uh, Mathieu, who's here in the audience, uh, wrote uh, the opening statement, uh, releasing Deep Freeze uh, into the world. And everything in this talk, uh, and maybe a bit more if you just want to read it back, it's all on our blog post. Uh, just Google Picnic Tech Blog, and you'll find it. So uh, with that said, um, Today, we talked about uh, DeepFreeze, which is a data fault framework. Uh, I talked a lot about uh, data at Picnic. We capture a lot of data from all kinds of operational systems. Um, and we use that, uh, we use the data fault model as a capturing layer to store all the data all the time. Um, one key component of that is generating the load SQL, which is DeepFreeze, our data fault framework. And it's open source, it's for you to play with, it's for you to look at. Um, it's, uh, it's all in there. And I talked a bit about uh, why and how to open source, um, which is that, uh, yeah, it basically makes us better and hopefully makes the world better. Um, so if you really like this, uh, we are hiring uh, just a Google Picnic career. And uh, if you uh, are really into this thing, if you uh, um, love the Python demo, if you uh, love uh, SQL and uh, data modeling, uh, then uh, talk to us. Thank you very much. <laughs>